Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. In prayer, if you could please stand. <laughs> Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. And make us worthy, O Master, to dare with confidence and without condemnation to call upon thee the heavenly God as upon a father and to say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father Joseph. Last week, we, I'm not going to talk about what we said last week except for about two minutes, sacraments rooted in the word mystery, rooted in the New Testament, in the plan of God, which is. It's the plan of God to share his life with us. It's that easy. That's the gospel message. You want to whittle it down in our big tomes, our thick catechisms and so forth. The entire catechism says one thing over and over again in a hundred thousand different ways. That God loves us and wants to share his life with us. And if you understand that, you understand everything that I'm holding in my hand in the catechism and everything that's included in the sacred scriptures and everything in included in any decent theological text written in the history of the church, because it's the revelation of one simple and yet inexhaustible mystery that God wants to share his life with us. And now it's our job to seek to understand that. Okay? Now, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. We, we finished with baptism very quickly last time. I'm just going to refer back to it, so turn there very quickly. All of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. And to be baptized means to be plunged again, right? Be plunged into his death. This is why the church traditionally baptized by immersion. If you read the catechism of the Catholic Church, it says it's preferable to baptize by immersion. This is the practice still retained in the East, okay? And it very much encouraged in the West. St. Thomas made it very clear uh, and the catechism today it makes it very clear. It's a preferable way to baptize. Why? Because it more perfectly shows forth that reality of our death and burial with Christ, being submerged underneath the waters, buried underneath the waters. And St. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 6, those who are baptized into Christ in his death are also to be likened to him in his resurrection. Because as he says, Death no longer has dominion over Christ, and therefore those who are baptized into Christ, plunged into Christ in his death, death no longer has dominion over us. Death for us has been transformed from a separation from God to a gateway into communion of eternal life. Does that make sense? It's, I, I, obviously, there's a lot more we could say about that. But if you get that basic information in Romans chapter 6, you'll understand what the scriptures have to tell us about baptism. Now to full, more fully understand it, of course, we look back to the Old Testament as God prepared for the revelation of the New Testament sacraments, the New Testament mysteries, his way of giving his life to us in Christ. He prepared the way for that in the Old Testament. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, talks about, if you're scanning it there, it talks about the flood. Peter says, your baptism corresponds to this exactly, namely the flood. Why does he say your baptism and the flood have a correspondence? Exactly, he says. Because in the flood, sinful man was buried underneath the waters, died underneath those waters, and the people of God, through those waters of the flood, as through a tomb, 
guided in the ark safely, an image of the church, came forth to the presence of God once again. So if you want to understand baptism, St. Peter says, go back and study the flood, and you'll understand what's taking place now today. Okay? Nothing new is with God. It's the same revelation of his love for us. And so it looks very similar to what he did in the Old Testament. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, Israel was baptized into Moses, plunged into Moses in the Red Sea. Why does he say that? There's a certain aspect, a fundamental aspect of faith, which is involved in baptism, supplied by the entire believing community as Israel of old stood on the edge of the, of the Red Sea. And in faith, they walked with Moses into what looked to them to be a sure place of death. And only in faith that Moses would lead them safely to the other side. They were united in him, grafted into him. And St. Paul says, similarly, you are baptized today into Christ Jesus. If you want to understand baptism today, go back and read the story of the crossing of the Red Sea. And you'll see all sorts of symbols there that are revealed to us in baptism today. The lighting of the, of the candle of the newly baptized, the fire that burned before Israel night and day, leading the way and saving Israel. The white garments that they wear, a sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit which now clothes us and clothed Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. And why do I say the Holy Spirit clothed Israel when they crossed the Red Sea? Because Moses reveals when he sings his hymn to God in that text that it was by the power of God's Spirit that he parted the waters. And it was through that Holy Spirit that Israel came, being given the gift of the Holy Spirit there in their baptism in the Red Sea. Okay? So these images, I'm not going to go any further, but I encourage you, turn off the television, throw out the New York Times, especially during Lent, go back and read these texts so that you can understand your own preparation for baptism, which is about to take place in the Paschal Mystery of Christ that we're about to celebrate. We're going to leave that behind us for now, even though there's much more we could say about it. The Sacrament of Confirmation or Chrismation. The sacrament by which we are anointed, we receive the chrism of the church, I think is one of the most misunderstood sacraments. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about some basic ideas and let, let you flesh it out as you, you consider those ideas at home. First of all, what is confirmation? What is chrismation? What does it do for us? Uh, it strengthens us, okay? All right, yeah, it gives us the Holy Spirit. What else? What do we commonly hear about confirmation? It makes us what? Yeah, full members or adults. huh? We've heard that, adults in the faith and so forth. Okay, All of these things are partially true. Let's come back to that Holy Spirit aspect. Okay, We would all agree that in chrismation or in confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit, don't we? Yeah. Do you not receive the Holy Spirit in baptism? So how do baptism and confirmation differ if the fundamental aspect of both gives the same mystery of the Holy Spirit? You say, we shall see? You will see. Okay. First of all, remember this. Every sacrament gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because every sacrament gives us the gift of God's own life. I, as I mentioned last time, the sacraments, I, I like to imagine them as the arteries, seven arteries in the body of Christ in the church by which we're nourished. The same gift being given, but in seven different ways to different portions of the body at different times. Most oftentimes we associate, I think, associate the, the, the sacrament of confirmation with Pentecost. Okay, with the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost upon the apostles. Also, turn to John chapter 1, very quickly. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, this is John the Baptist, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, for he was before me. 
I myself did not know him, but for this I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Notice in the Gospel of John, John's focus is on the Holy Spirit in the context of Jesus' baptism. And we're going to come down just a few verses then to verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew. Go ahead. Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought them, him to Jesus. How did he know he was the Messiah? This, here, this is one of John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, runs off. He's, he's there at the baptism of Christ. He runs off, finds his brother, and says, I have found the Messiah. First of all, what does the word Messiah mean? Good. Yeah, John says it means the Christ, right? And we get into a translational issue, but it's simply that. Yeah, it means anointed. The one who was anointed by God. The one they were awaiting in the Old Testament. He has finally come. And notice what he notices about Jesus' baptism is that gift which John has pointed out very clearly in Jesus' baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and interprets that for us by saying Jesus is the Anointed One, the Messiah. Here in the context of Jesus' baptism, he is anointed with the Holy Spirit. And in the Old Testament, what types of people were anointed? Yeah, kings, who else? Priests, yeah? And prophets, exactly. We're going to talk about the priest and prophet thing in a few minutes, but I want to focus on that aspect of Christ's, or Jesus' Christness, Jesus' anointing, Jesus' kingship, which he receives there at his baptism. Turn back with me to 1 Samuel Chapter 10, verse 1. We're going to read chapter 10, verse 1, and then we're going to jump to chapter 10, verse 6. Okay, go ahead. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be a prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies round about. Okay, this is the text speaking of the anointing of King Saul. Okay, and notice what verse 6 says. When the anointing with oil comes down, what happens to the person? Go ahead. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Okay, so here in the context of the anointing of Saul, we could also look at the anointing of, of David or the anointing of Solomon. Notice, Jesus is not the first Christ, he's not the first Messiah. All those who were anointed in the Old Testament were called the Christ, the anointed one of God, the King. Okay? So this was already a concept very familiar to the Jews. They were looking forward to the restoration of the one who was to be anointed by God, namely the King. But Saul was not the first king of Israel either. And if you turn back just one page with me in your Bibles to chapter 8, verse 1, well, not verse 1, but we'll look at that, because there was a problem with the anointing of Saul as king. And the problem is found in verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us like all the nations. They wanted... They didn't want a king who would govern them in such order them and rule them and have dominion over them in, a, in the right way, the way God would, but like all the other nations. And this was the problem. We keep reading in verse 6, But the thing displeased Samuel when, he, when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, from being king over them. Who was the first king on earth? God was the first king on earth. And this, I believe, is an important step in our understanding of the gift of confirmation or chrismation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because God is the model 
of kingship, of anointing, what it means to rule the people, what it means to have dominion. And this brings us back to the context in which we need to be focusing, and it's the same context I always bring us back to, and that is the book of Genesis and the story of creation. Because we know that if we find out things about God, we also find things out about man. Because man is made in the image and likeness of God. And if God is to be king over creation, then man also, in the footsteps of God, if you will, is to also rule creation and have dominion over it. To be anointed with the Holy Spirit in order to be king of creation. Turn back with me quickly to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and so forth. Go on, Melanie, to verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. Okay. Notice Adam is placed in creation, in paradise, and given dominion. What kind of person has dominion? A king has dominion. Adam was to be the king of paradise. Say, in the shoes of God. In the image and likeness of God. He was to have dominion over creation. And what does it mean to have dominion? It means to order creation. To make sure all the proper things are there in their proper place. And if they're disordered, to put them back in order. If you will, to till and keep the garden. To make it grow and make it flourish and make the parts work well together. This was the purpose of of Adam's dominion in creation. St. Gregory of Nyssa says this, Human nature created to rule the world because of his resemblance to the universal king has been made like a living image that participates in the archetype by dignity and by name. Adam was in creation and his whole purpose there was to continue what God had begun in creation. God had begun to place order there. Adam was there to perfect that order, to bring it towards its conclusion. And notice the gift which God is giving us. It's the same gift we talked about last time. It's the gift of God's own life in who and what he is. It's not enough for God. He he loves us so much that he is going to be our king and rule us. No, he loves us far beyond that. He loves us so much that he will make us to stand in his shoes and be kings like he is. To make us participants in what he is in relationship to creation. Placing it in order and healing it when it's in disorder. Notice then, turning back to the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus, the King, the Christ, comes and what does he do? What is the evidence that he is the Messiah? That he is the one sent from God to have dominion and restore that dominion over creation. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 6. And when Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is he who takes no offense at me. You notice what Jesus, his proof of his kingship. His proof of his kingship to John is that he is setting the creation in the right order. He's seeing it disordered, and he's fixing it. Okay, He's exercising his dominion as the one anointed by God to be king. And that's his evidence, and that's his proof. Turn then to Acts chapter 2, that text we always go to in reference to the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to point out one aspect of it. We're going to look at chapter 2, where 
the tongues of fire descend upon the apostles, and they begin to speak in tongues. They begin to convert people in massive numbers. A very important aspect of chrismation and dominion is that the truth is brought out. That's why the, the kingship and the, and the uh, prophetic office in the Old Testament are drawn so closely together, and also priesthood, which we'll talk about in a minute. Okay? Because an important aspect is rational creatures is that we're not forcing the order upon creation, but we're bringing the order to creation. And so they bring that order by preaching the, tr- the truth of Jesus Christ. And notice what happens at their hands. People convert. Their life is changed. They receive eternal life. Order is put back in their life. But notice, once they leave the upper room, we get the story in chapter 3. And Peter and John were going up to the temple. Okay, this is right in the context of Pentecost. They leave the upper room. They head to the temple. Okay, which, of course, is, is right there. I mean, it, you know, you've got to walk maybe 15 minutes through the old city of Jerusalem. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. There's our office, the hour of prayer. There were hours in which they prayed the Psalter. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried who they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called the beautiful, to ask alms of those who enter the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, and John said, look at us. I love that text. Can you imagine? The gift of the Holy Spirit comes, and he says, look at me. And he fixed his attention upon them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but I give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And the man stood up. What Jesus had done in the Gospels, the apostles were now to do in the church. To bring order to creation. To place things in their proper order. And yes, even to heal physically what is going on. And more importantly, behind that physical healing, a spiritual healing. St. Cyprian talks about baptism and confirmation as the double sacrament. The double sacrament. We looked at that text of our Lord's baptism. And we saw there in baptism, it was not only baptism by by water, but what the early church called also baptism by, by the Holy Spirit, what John was talking about. Chrismation, anointing, together. A double sacrament. If you want to understand confirmation or chrismation, you have to understand it in the context of baptism. Because it continues on, as some have said, perfects what was begun in baptism. Okay. Unfortunately, today, we separate the sacraments out so far that we begin to give a new theology. We become adults in the faith, if you will. Something foreign to the mind of the early church. Because baptism and chrismation in the early church were done together. Given to infants. Perfecting the children. Making them, in a sense, making them Christians. huh? Making them those who were anointed. That's what it means to be a Christian, to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so these are two aspects. It's saying, simply says, a double sacrament. And yet, they are separate. We find that in the New Testament, in Acts, in the Epistles. I'll just point out one text. Acts chapter 8. You can turn there very quick. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. There you have it. Okay, That early practice of the church of the laying on of hands, which we still see in relationship especially to ordination, the laying on of hands. And we also see in the Old Testament that aspect of anointing with oil, both of which now are relevant to us today. I'll conclude with a quote from St. Cyril of Jerusalem. 
Having become worthy of this holy chrism, you are called Christians, making the name truly yours by regeneration. Before you were worthy of this grace, you did not truly merit this name, but you were on the way, aiming to become Christians. Notice the aspect then of baptism and and chrismation in the early church for St. Cyril of Jerusalem. It's only through chrismation and confirmation that the, that the person fully becomes a Christian, able then to have that aspect of dominion go out and share Christ with the world. But you are on the way, aiming to become Christians. It is necessary that you should know that the figure of this chrism is to be found in the Old Testament when Moses imparted to his brother the divine commandment in constituting him high priest Having washed him with water, he anointed him. And he was also called Christ because of the figurative chrism. In the same way also the high priest in establishing Solomon as king anointed him after washing him in the Gihon, in the spring in Jerusalem. But these things were done to them in figure. But to you, not in figure, but in truth. Since you have been really anointed with the Holy Spirit, for the principle of your salvation is the anointed one, Christ. From St. Cyril of Jerusalem. This is found in, in Cardinal Jean Danielou's book, The Bible and the Liturgy, which I recommended last time. You've got to have that in your library. I'm sure you have questions about that, but I hope that gives you some guidance for your further study to be able to consider what's taking place. And notice the unity of the sacraments of baptism and chrismation in the church today. On Easter, on Pascha, when the catechumens come into the church and are baptized and immediately chrismated and then immediately receive Holy Communion. Okay? This goes back to the ancient practice of the church. And in fact, today in the East, it is common for priests to confirm. And in the Roman church also, in the case of an emergency of illness, a priest has the ability to confirm or chrismate a child. Okay? An infant if they're at the point of death, is to be confirmed, the church says. We can talk about why the separation, the historical things behind that, if you want, later during Q&A. But again, understand them together, and you'll be far better off in understanding what's taking place in the sacrament. We'll stop making a theology up for ourselves of what it means, and start to understand the theology of the early church in relationship to the sacrament. We're going to turn to the Eucharist then, and priesthood. I want to do the Eucharist and priesthood together, because I think it's going to kind of in a sense, kill two birds with one stone, but they have to be understood together because the priesthood is ordered towards the Eucharist. And you can only understand a thing by what it does. It's an old philosophical principle. If you know what the thing does, you know what the thing is. Action follows upon being. Action follows upon being. The thing barks, it's a dog, Okay, and we're going to find out what a priest does, and then we're going to understand who he is and what he is. I want to follow one particular line. First of all, what does the word Eucharist mean? Thanksgiving. And I I was just, you know, writing my notes, I thought, it kind of begs the question. Thanksgiving for what? Who's Thanksgiving? And what's this Thanksgiving have to do with the body and blood of Jesus which we receive in the church? I think these are valid questions that should be answered. Okay, and I think we can, we can kind of dig a little bit and find out some answers to those in the scriptures. First of all, our common say, apologetic text for, this, for, for the Eucharist in the New Testament is John chapter 6. So why don't we go ahead and turn there. We're not going to look at it as maybe we would if we were doing apologetics here, but uh, we'll still take a look at it. Because I think there's something there that's going to put us on the right line to understand. Chapter 6, verse 30. And what I want to point as we're reading that, don't read it yet, just listen for a second. Just pay attention to what images are used and we'll be able to understand we'll be able to understand the Eucharist better. Our Lord himself says, kind of, almost kind of says, you want to understand the Eucharist? You've got to go understand this other thing first, in a way. Let's go, let's go ahead and hear it. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. 
So there's this whole discussion there in John chapter 6 about manna. And Jesus says, yeah, you see the manna in the Old Testament? Um, Well, guess what? They ate it, and yeah, it sustained them, but they still died. I'm going to give you something like that, but you're not going to die. It's going to give you eternal life. Going back to that idea of typology used here in John chapter 6 of the manna pointing to the Eucharist. If you want to understand the Eucharist, in John chapter 6, you're standing there with our Lord after He's just crossed the Sea of Galilee and He's come to the other side and they're questioning Him. He all of a sudden brings up this image of, ma- of manna. Well, so you've got to ask yourself, what did manna do for Israel in the Old Testament? What was His purpose? Yeah, sustained them, it fed them, it gave them life, okay, on a natural level, yeah? Yeah, during what time? Yeah, during the Exodus, during their time in the desert, right? Their journey in the desert, well, they're journeying toward the promised land. And the fathers loved that image because also in the church, we are journeying toward the kingdom to come. And God gives us our manna, in a sense, in the Eucharist, to strengthen us in our journey, that we may not die in the desert of this life, but we might come to paradise. But manna ultimately is going to point itself to something in between the manna and the Eucharist. I'm going to see that in Joshua chapter 5. Turn to Joshua chapter 5. Okay, a little context here. Israel's just crossed the desert, right? They spent their 40 years uh, working out for their sin of faithlessness when they refused to enter the promised land the first time. You remember, when they were they going to go in the promised land the first time in Numbers chapter 13, that they went in and they got some of the fruit of the land. Do you remember that? And they brought it back out and they said, the land we're about to enter, or at least two of them did, Joshua and Caleb, said, it's flowing with milk and honey and the, and the pomegranates and the grapes are there. They had to put grapes in between two poles. They were so huge. In other words, the land was filled with God's own gift of, his, of food to sustain man. But this food was beyond anything they had ever seen. And here in Joshua chapter 5, they finally work out their 40 years for their refusal to go in. And they come then, they cross the Jordan River, and they're about to attack Jericho. And they spend their first night encamped on the edge of the Jordan River on the other side of the Jordan, right? They finally entered into the Promised Land. And look at what it says. Did I give you your verse yet? Oh, chapter 5, verse 10. Go. While the people of Israel were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. And on the morrow after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened oat cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased on the morrow when they ate of the produce of the land. Okay, what was the manna preparing for? The fruit of the promised land. When they received what the manna pointed to and foreshadowed and fulfilled, sustained them for, it ceased because the shadow was no longer necessary. They never, no longer needed the manna to sustain them for they received what the manna was for. Namely, to give them life during their time in the desert so that they could come to the promised land and receive. I'll just put fruit up here. The manna pointed to the fruit of the promised land. And ultimately, the fruit of the promised land then is going to point us to the Eucharist. But it takes us actually one step further in reverse. Because there's something about this promised land that's absolutely essential that you know. Some of you have heard me say this over and over again. The Jews believed the promised land to be the location of paradise. That God was bringing them back, not to just some random land that he had given to Abraham in the beginning, but he had given it to Abraham as an inheritance because it was the land of the people of God. It was the land of Adam and Eve. They believed Jerusalem to be the the physical location of paradise. And so as they prepared themselves to enter back into that land, we get an inkling of that in in Numbers chapter 13 where Caleb and Joshua come out with fruit like, you know, grapes the size of watermelons and people that are eating the food in the promised land are giants. They're growing, they're huge men. It's almost a mystical 
land and mystical food which they're eating in that land. And God is now bringing them back to that place. They understood that food of the promised land to be, in, in some sense, the reestablishment of the food which Adam and Eve were to eat in paradise. Where the rivers flowed with milk and honey. Where there was nothing that they would have need for. They would be satisfied. And so this takes us again back to the book of Genesis, where I want to take us. So again, turn back then to Genesis chapter 2. I want to look at Adam, Adam's priesthood. I want to look at the garden, and I want to look at the Eucharist. St. Paul tells us that Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is the new Adam. If you want to understand what Jesus is doing, you better understand what the old Adam was supposed to do. And he says, also, Jesus is our new high priest. And St. Paul says that every priest offers sacrifice. That's the nature of the priesthood. Okay, Every priest offers sacrifice. Christ himself offers the ultimate once-for-all sacrifice. And it's here that I think we're going to discover the priesthood of Adam, and therefore the priesthood of Jesus Christ, and the priesthood of the New Testament and its connection with the Eucharist. I want to read you a quick quotation from Cardinal Ratzinger's Spirit of the Liturgy. He says, In all religions, sacrifice is at the heart of worship. But this is a concept that has been buried under the debris of endless misunderstanding. I love that idea of the debris, the trash of endless misunderstanding. The common view is that sacrifice has something to do with destruction. It means handing over to God a reality that is in some way precious to man. Now this handing over, he's right, right? I mean, this is right along what we oftentimes think. Now this handing over presupposes it is withdrawn from the use of man, and that can only happen through its destruction, its definitive removal from the hands of man. I've heard this stuff about incense. We burn the incense to destroy it because it's something precious to us. And nothing could be farther from the truth. This immediately raises the question, what pleasure is God supposed to take in destruction? Is anything really surrendered to God through destruction? One answer is that destruction always conceals within itself the act of acknowledging God's sovereignty over all things. But can such a mechanical act really serve God's glory? Obviously not. And here's the heart of the matter. True surrender to God True sacrifice looks very different. It consists, according to the fathers, in the union of man and creation with God. Notice, we talked about that, the mystery of God's plan last time. It consists in the union of man and creation with God. That's the nature of sacrifice. Belonging to God has nothing to do with destruction or non-being. It is rather a way of being. That is why St. Augustine could say that the true sacrifice is the city of God. That is, love transformed mankind, the divinization of creation, and the surrender of all things to him. St. John Damascene says of paradise, God says, of every tree of paradise you shall eat, meaning by all things you will be drawn up to me. Think about that union of man with God that the Pope was just talking about being drawn up to me, their creator, and from them reap the one fruit, which is myself, who am the true life. Let all things be fruitful to you and make participation in me to be the substance of your existence. And thus you shall be immortal. The fruits of creation were meant to reveal to us, to allow us to participate in the life of God and to cause that union to take place. In chapter 2, in the midst of the garden, there are two trees planted. The tree of knowledge and the tree of life. And if man ate from the tree of life, he would? He would live forever. He would receive immortal life, the life of God himself. This is where Thanksgiving comes into the story. Well, I'll give you another philosophical principle that you have to have in your pocket that the last thing in execution is always the first thing in intention. If you're going to make a dinner, 
if you want to make a burrito, first you got to make the beans. You got to fry up the peppers. You got to make your tortillas and you got to wrap it all together and you finally get what you began your planning for. And this is also true with creation. There are how many days in creation? Six. Sixth day. And on the sixth day, God created? Man. Created man. The fathers tell us that all of the created order was oriented toward man as to its perfection. In other words, God created the whole universe for Adam and Eve and for me and you. All of it ordered to man. St. John Chrysostom says, What is it that is about to be created that enjoys such honor? It is man, that great and wonderful living creature, more precious in the eyes of God than all other creatures. For him, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all the rest of creation exist. God attached so much importance to his salvation that he did not spare his own son for the sake of man. The Catechism goes on and says, God created everything for man. But man in turn was created to serve and love God and to offer all things back to Him. Because once man realizes that his entire life, his entire existence is a gift from God, it's a revelation of God's love. When you realize that your entire life is dependent upon another person, there is only one reasonable thing to do. And that is to live your life as a gift from Him. And ultimately, in thanksgiving to the one who gave it to you. And this brings us into the aspect of Adam's priesthood and his sacrifice and the Eucharist. All things were created for man, who was the culmination of creation. But notice that there's something more to the created order. Man is not the end of the creation story, is he? There are six days in which God creates, but there's a seventh day. And on that seventh day, what does God do? He rests. Was God tired? I think oftentimes we have that image of God sitting back on his couch with a Coors Light in his hand. Ah, that was tough. No. No. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. What does God do when he rests? Go ahead, Melanie. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation. What did Jesus do when he, or what did God, well, yes, what did Jesus do when he finished creating? He rested and he blessed it and he sanctified it. When a thing is blessed, it is sanctified. It is made holy. Holiness is an attribute of God and God alone. When a thing is blessed, it becomes a participant in who and what God is. That's what God does in creation. But we're forgetting about one person, Adam. Because Adam was made in the image and likeness of God. And just as Adam was to have dominion over creation, say, as a reflection of the dominion of the king of all, so Adam was to sanctify creation in the image of the one who blesses and sanctifies. Adam's job in creation was not simply to put physical order into creation, but to put spiritual order into creation. To bless and sanctify creation. And ultimately, to offer that life which he had received and the life which the whole created order received back to God. And it's found there in that blessing and sanctifying. To recognize that it is a gift from God, that it is his and his alone, And we are now placed in his shoes to bring it to its perfection. To offer it in thanksgiving to the one who offered it to us. To offer creation as a Eucharist to the Father. The whole of the created order in the book of Genesis before the fall was designed, it was made to be Eucharisted. To be offered in thanksgiving to God 
to take what man had and give it back to God. And what is God going to do with it? He's going to give it back to us because he loves us. I was thinking, like the funny term, you, know, you get the sense of the circle of love, right? But I don't think, I'm not talking about in some kind of hippy-dippy kind of way. The circle of God's love. Because the more we realize what God has given us, the more we want to give it back to the one who gave it to us, and the more he gives us. And we grow in holiness, and the created order grows in holiness. Jesus is our Eucharist because his entire life is tied up with his offering of himself to the Father. His realization that everything he has is a gift from God and therefore is to be given and lived back in relationship to that gift. But notice, just as it's not enough for God to be king of creation, if that's not enough, that he loves us that much. But he wants to draw us up. And not just us, but the entire created order. He takes bread, and he takes wine, and he lifts these things up to become a participant in his own life, to become his flesh and his blood. Just like the tree of life in the center of creation was there as a revelation of God himself, that man could eat from the tree of life, a created thing, and receive the life of God himself. When we receive the Eucharist in the church, it is the Eucharist which Adam and Eve were designed to receive in creation. I'll conclude that with a quote from St. Ephraim. It takes us back a little bit to what we were talking about with the tree of life. He writes poetically. St. Ephraim always spoke, he did his theology in poetry, and it's so beautiful. Listen to this. He says, Greatly saddened was the tree of life, when it beheld Adam stolen away from it. Greatly saddened was the tree of life when it beheld Adam stolen away from it. It sank down into the virgin ground and was hidden, only to burst forth and reappear on Golgotha. And upon that tree, Christ is nailed who says to us, Eat and you will live forever giving us back that which Adam lost in paradise. Now, I've got to cover a lot in the next five minutes, but we're going to do it. All right, we're going to do the sacrament of, of penance or confession or reconciliation. You always want your, your words to mean something to you. And I think that word reconciliation so beautifully captures what the sacrament does. When we confess to Christ and we receive back the reconciliation. We are restored to that union with God. Turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay. In fact, our Lord's name, Yahweh saves, Joshua, Jesus, is a revelation of this great mystery of what God wants for us, to reconcile us to himself. The fathers call the sacrament of confession a second baptism in which we're renewed again like the day of our baptism, reborn in the image and likeness of God. Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins, namely, particularly, to save us from the fall, to reconcile us back to himself. And it's in that context that we have to understand the sacrament of penance or confession. Okay, turn again to Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on his bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. Yeah, I want the, all the Protestants listening to this talk over the next couple of years on our thing to listen to that. They glorified God because he had given something that was proper to God alone. That's the mystery of God's love. 
Not that he hoards it to himself. Yes, only God forgives sins, friends. Catholics and our Protestant brothers and sisters here tonight and listening online, Catholics only believe that God can forgive sins. No man can forgive sins. But we also believe that God wants to raise us up to participate in Him. That God loves us, period. God loves us. He loves us so much that He not only wants to forgive our sins, He wants us to participate in His own forgiveness of sins. He wants to reach through our hands and through our mouths to speak those words of reconciliation. And of course, I could give you the apologetic text. If you're writing it down, write it in John chapter 20, verse 21. Our Lord breathes on the apostles whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. We're not going to turn to those. Talking about the ministry of reconciliation. I want to turn to one other text that's absolutely essential for us for our next 30 seconds together, which is probably going to take more like five minutes. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 very quickly. Absolutely fundamental that you get this. Just as important as Romans chapter 6 in relationship to baptism. Chapter 12, verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one Spirit we were all plunged, we were all baptized into one body, into Christ. Jews, Greeks, slaves, and free, all were made to drink of the one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but many. You know this text well, right? This is read in the the liturgy. What is he talking about? That each one of us in the body of Christ is given a participation in our own way, in a different way. Each one of us receives that blood flowing through the arteries in a unique way. And it does not detract from the the body. that it, It works like that. It's not a detriment to the body that the foot can't talk. And it's not a detriment to the mouth that it can't walk. They both work together, unified as one. It is Christ and Christ alone who forgives sins. But that gift of forgiveness is revealed in the body of Christ according to its proper place in the body. Just as a hand does hand things and a foot does foot things, so a priest does priest things, a layperson does layperson things, a bishop does other things, and you have your own unique gifts. And it is not a detriment to any of us It's for the upbuilding of the body of Christ until here on earth Christ is made fully present. Should there be confession of sins and forgiveness of sins within the church? If there isn't, the church isn't the body of Christ because Christ forgives sins. It better be in the church. That's my one point. Apply that to every aspect of the sacraments. The anointing of the sick and marriage. We will be looking at two quick texts. Turn to the epistle of James chapter 5. This is the classic apologetic text that we beat Protestants over the head with and Protestants beat us with other texts, but we're going to take a look at that. James chapter 5 verse 14. We're going to read through verse 14 through 16. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up. Notice something. There are particular people in the church, in the body of Christ, that have this ability. This is very biblical. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The second thing, it's not magic. It is the prayer of faith. Because faith unites us to God. When we unite ourselves to God and He unites Himself to us, all things are possible. And if He has committed sins, He will be forgiven. Therefore, Okay, period. That's what I wanted. And if if He's committed sins, He'll be forgiven. The sacrament of the sick, the anointing of the sick, is for the healing of the body and the soul. And it is God who will determine how and when He will heal for the betterment of His body, for the revelation of the fullness of Christ on earth. Okay? Behind that anointing is not just an asking for the physical healing, but ultimately, faith in God 
and the forgiveness of sins. Why? Because it is the spiritual life which is our, it's our perfect life, the fullness of life. And it's that which Christ has come to set in order now. That's James chapter 5, and we're going to turn to the question of marriage. You know our Lord goes to the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2. Just remember this. We're not going to look at it. Remember this. What God touches, He sanctifies. Okay? He communicates His life. He loves. He touches bread and wine at the mystical supper. He makes it the revelation of His body and His blood. He touches marriage at the wedding at Cana. He makes it a sacrament, a place where He can love us. He can share His life with us. He touches water in the Jordan River, and what was common water communicates divine life. Again, not magic. It's the plan of God from all eternity. Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Last text I'm going to have you turn to, and we'll be done tonight. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. What's the meaning of the sacraments? What's the purpose of the sacraments? To unite two as one. Marriage is a revelation, a revelation of God's plan. But it's not enough for God to love man. He wants us to stand in His shoes and love other men like He loves us. And the same mystery which will take place between God and man will also take place among us. And man and woman shall become one flesh as a symbol of what God has done for us in His church and as a token of what He has planned for the whole created order. You want to know why all of creation fell when Adam sinned? Because he had a spiritual communion with all of creation. What we know about the church was the plan of God in the beginning. And just as there is one body which has a common lifeblood flowing through it. And when one part of the body is hurt, the whole body is affected. When one sins, the whole body is damaged. When one does not fulfill its part within the body, the whole body is affected. And so in marriage, as a, as a symbol, as a token of that in our families, that life is shared between two people who truly become one. They have a common life together. And together, God will save them. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I appreciate your attention. I I had that concluding quote. You guys want to hear the concluding quote? Melanie's already there. Read it, Melanie. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Don't turn there. Don't turn. Go. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Amen. But we'll do a Q&A in a few minutes for those that can stay around. Okay, all right, let's go. Those who are staying around, come on back in. Melanie's saying I skipped the priesthood. I didn't skip it. Okay, just so you know. All right, hold on. Adam's priesthood. Of course, priesthood, sacrifice. What is sacrifice? That's fine, but I would connect that then to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again and the body of Christ. That within the body, there is certain... But this brings up another point that, I'm, that, that is important that I wasn't able to cover, and that is the Levitical priesthood was a stopgap measure because of the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. Before the sin of the golden calf at Mount Sinai, the priesthood was the priesthood of the firstborn, the head of the family. Every firstborn or every head of the family would have been a priest. And that's where we get back to this priesthood of all believers. In the church, all of these aspects that we find unique revelations of, say, in the priesthood, always found within the body, and then particular aspects or particular parts of the body fulfill certain functions within the body. But that priesthood is rooted in the body, which is Christ. You go read the section on infallibility in the catechism, I'm sick and tired of Catholics going after Protestants on infallibility by turning to Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. We do a terrible disservice to the church. 
revelation of infallibility within the church is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the one that is infallible because He's God. And infallibility then is in the body of Christ and is then revealed to us particularly when the body speaks. And certain parts of the body speak and certain parts don't. But you got to understand that the church is infallible. And guess what? For St. Paul, the church is the body of Christ. And that means you, and that means me, and that means the priests and the bishops, and yes, the Pope. But you understand it, and you turn to the catechism on infallibility, and what's the first thing they say? The first thing is that the body of Christ, and that means the members of the body of Christ, are infallible. In a particular way. And it has to be understood properly. Okay? But unfortunately, we do apologetics and we come at it from the other end and we try to prove the infallibility of the Pope. And to be honest with you, it sounds like magic. That's not the faith. The faith is that God loves us and wants to share His life with us. And therefore, the things that are proper to God are then found within man. Priesthood, rooted in the revelation of Jesus Christ and His body, the church. <coughs> Oh, thank you. Uh, this is about confirmation. Mm -hmm. I was I was confirmed um, at a time roughly in coincidental with the fall of Rome, and at that <laughs> <laughs> strike that from the recording. At, strike that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Thank no? you. Thank you. All right, go ahead. And um, at that time, one of the important, even essential, emphases of what was involved in the sacrament of confirmation was was our having theoretically achieved a degree of knowledge yes. and ability to be tested in standing up for our faith. Yeah, exactly. That was symbolized yeah. with the slap. I don't no. know how long it's been okay. since this stuff has happened, and I no, don't know where know. it's found in Scripture or whether, yeah. but I'd like to. Okay, fine, fine. But just remember this for everybody here that if, if the, the, the sacraments and the faith is dependent upon how smart we are, we're all in a bunch of trouble. Okay? We're all, the Pope included. We're talking about the mysteries of the faith. They go beyond our understanding, beyond our ability to grasp. We're dependent upon them. Okay? Um, quickly. First of all, we, I, 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 said, I talked about the, the Father's talked about confirmation or chrismation as a perfection, okay? a completion of what was begun in baptism. Okay? And in that way, you could see it in that aspect of being fully invested with the gift of the Holy Spirit. I have no problem with that. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas makes a comparison in the Summa between our bodily growth and our spiritual growth and talks about the sacraments in that way. And just as we become physically mature, so the sacraments mature us physically. Now, I'm not going to go after St. Thomas on this, because I think he, probably, he had a pretty good understanding, but it's our reading of St. Thomas where, is the, where the problem lies. Historically, initially, baptism and chrismation or confirmation were tied very closely together, yet distinct sacraments that we saw in Acts of the Apostles, and I had plenty of other texts to point that out to you also. But, tied as closely together as possible. And if at all possible, they were done together. You still see this in the Eastern churches today where children, infants, are baptized, confirmed, and receive Holy Communion on the same day. If you come to our, to our church, in fact, when you come for pre-sanctified, God willing, my children will be there. My little baby, Carlino, five months old, will be brought up, and he doesn't know what he's doing, depending upon the faith of the church. And he receives from a golden spoon, as you will, the body and blood of our Lord. He was chrismated confirmed in the faith, and as an infant. So this was the ancient practice of the church. In the West, a realization, just as you saw in Acts of the Apostles, they called the Apostles, right? They called the Apostles, get down here and confirm this guy, call down the Holy Spirit upon him. And so always chrismation is tied to that apostolic gift which they received on Pentecost, East and West. But it was lived out in the church in two different ways. In the East, the bishop said, well, the priesthood is an extension of the episcopacy. It is. 
Okay? It's an extension of the, of, of the role of bishop. And so, the priest, by an extension, by permission, can chrismate or confirm, using the, chris, the chrism given to him by the bishop. In the West, also a priest can chrismate or confirm, as you will see on Easter Sunday, right? On the Easter Vigil, and on occasion of a child being the case of death, right? And yet, the time was drawn out over time as the bishop visited the church less and less, it became more infrequent as the dioceses grew and travel became more difficult. So the time between baptism and confirmation in the West were drawn apart. And that was the root of this separation which took place. Now, we can go further into it because there's all sorts of reasons why it ended up being drawn out so far all the way to the age of reason, okay, which I don't want to get into. And ultimately, in, during the time of the French Revolution... In France, okay, this indicates to you it's not a good idea. Okay? <laughs> the sacraments were drawn out so far, probably because of, of rationalism, the, 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 the era of rationalism that was taking place, this excessive dependence upon my understanding. Confirmation and the Eucharist were drawn out all the way to 14, 15, sometimes 16 years old. Until Rome finally stepped in and said, you cannot refuse the Eucharist to somebody beyond seven years old, the age of reason. Now that gets into a whole other problem I'm not going to tackle right now. But what did the French do? Instead of keeping the sacraments together where they chrismated and gave Eucharist at 14 years old, instead of bringing it back and putting it at seven years old, they simply took and brought the Eucharist back to seven years old and left confirmation or chrismation at 14. And that's the practice we receive today in the West. Spread from France in the late 1700s. Okay, a flipping of the sacraments. The Pope understands the problem. It's come up, and I think uh, two synods ago the issue came up. And in fact, the bishop in Phoenix, Arizona has now reversed it and at least brought it back where he's chrismating the kids at age 7 and then giving them Holy Communion in their proper order. Okay? And it will, trust me, it's going to, re- it's going to be reestablish that proper order. Anyways, that goes way too far into detail. If you want to talk more about it, come up later. Would you say, is there any connection between the Pentateuch where the Law of Moses describes the sacrifice that people make and then give the sacrificed animal to the priestly people to eat? Mm-hmm. Is there any connection with that? Sure, I mean, these are all prefigurements. As, uh, not even, not all, we don't have to just go to the Pentateuch. Even among the pagan cultures, this idea, that's what St. Paul ends up confronting in, in, uh, in Acts, where, um, where they're, basically the, the, the pagan temple was a meat market, right? They were brought there, they were slaughtered, offered, and brought out on the tables. People were eating, but what are they going to do with all this food, right? And so it's something that was bound up in the created order itself. Paganism being a shadow, a kind of, you know, you imagine you got lost from your home and you hardly even remember it anymore. But there's certain things about it that you're, you're holding on to. And, uh, and so, yeah, absolutely. These, the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament were a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Christ. The most important thing, though, to realize about those sacrifices is that they were offering the life of the animal, not in its destructive aspect, but in its living aspect. This is the part about the sacrifice of Christ that's so important. God is not a bloodthirsty father who's so angry at us that he, that he says to his son, I'm going to take it out on you who did nothing. And then I'm going to be satisfied. Oh, my son was nailed to a cross and died most horribly, and now that makes me happy. <laughs> okay? It's a, it's a horrible idea, but I, th- I mean, we, I think oftentimes think about our Lord's sacrifice in that way. The beauty of our Lord's sacrifice is that though the murderers grabbed Him, and though they nailed Him to the cross, He never turned his back upon God like Adam had done in the beginning. He lived a life of Eucharist, of thanksgiving to the Father, even into the tomb. And because of that, he has the eternal life flowing in him. And when life enters into death, 
death is destroyed. Because life is like turning a light on in a dark room. Death no longer has dominion over Christ because he has in him eternal life. It cannot be wiped out by death because of his constant communion with the Father. And in that he becomes our sacrament by which we commune with him to receive that which God wants to give us. Last question. Go ahead. Okay. I hear a lot at work that uh, the Eucharist is kind of the summit of our existence as Christians. Mm -hmm. Like that's the biggest thing that we do. But I'm assuming there's no eating of the body and blood of our Lord in heaven. Like mm. oh, maybe this is kind of as oh, a constant, but no, like. Excellent. Where's my shot? Uh-oh. Yeah. Remember shadow and reality. Pope Benedict brings this up in his spirit of a liturgy. He says, the Old Testament was a shadow of the new. But the new, we could call it a shadow or an image, he's changing his terms, is a shadow of heaven. And in heaven, the sacraments will be revealed to us. Though we receive, say, under the aspects of bread and wine, right? They look like uh, bread and wine. They taste like bread and wine. And hidden mysteriously there, just like you would see Christ on earth, you see a man. But the question is, do your eyes of faith see God in the man? Do our eyes of faith discern God in the Eucharist or in baptism and so forth? In heaven, all shadows will be wiped out and the purpose of the sacraments will be revealed, namely the love of God. The the bread and wine will be transformed and all of the created order will be transformed and it will no longer just look like bread and taste like wine. Look at Moses. Look at the transfiguration. You want to know what you're going to look like when you resurrect bodily? Look at Christ in the transfiguration. You want to know what this earth is going to look like? This is a shadow. Just a shadow of what God has prepared for us. All of those things that we desire now and we see under veil, the veil will be lifted. Just like the veil is lifted to those who have the eyes of faith compared to those that do not. They simply see bread. We see the body of the Lord. Similarly, we who see the body of the Lord under the aspects of bread will see Christ himself. And he's just going to give us a big old bear hug. You guys think I'm crazy. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to love us. And all that love will be revealed to us in the created order. will be divinized. It will be divinized. And it will shine and communicate the life of God the way God planned for us in the beginning. Okay? God bless you. Thank you for coming. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.